Thank you for inviting me and being patient with the technical difficulties. <laughs> uh, and, and thank you for the warm introduction. And I'm honored to be part of the Blaylock, Blaylock Lecture Series. So with that, I will share the presentation. And uh, hopefully, uh, you, you, everybody else will get inspired by the, um, <laughs> by the pictures of Kenyan baboons. All right, with that, so I know that the original tile, uh, title as advertised was um, uh, Zebras as Mobile Social Users. Well, I am sorry to switch the title on you last minute, and we're going to talk about baboons as mobile social users and the dynamic networks of animal behavior. So as any dynamic network, uh, as any network analysis essentially starts, we start with data. And, um, uh, you know, there's, a, there's, particularly when we talk about animals, although when we talk about humans as well, there's a lot that goes into collecting the right data where we can actually talk about social, social behavior and social interactions. We then define some sort of network on those data. And there are many, many options of how we define network. And, uh, uh, we'll talk a little bit about how we go from network, from data to network, and why. There are many options then in representing that data partic uh, network, particularly when we talk about dynamic networks. Um, we have to make choices about the temporal resolution of uh, how do we aggregate, do we discretize time, do we represent events or or interactions or the duration, and so on and so forth. And only then we can really talk about the, anal the network analysis and extracting patterns and structure from the, those networks. And then that hopefully provide insight in the uh, original domain where the data came from and the questions were asked about. And so today I'll show a little bit, a couple of examples of going through this cycle, sorry, and um, how we might you know, what questions might we be able to answer, ask and answer using dynamic network analysis and dynamic network representation. So data. You know, when we talk about ecological data or data about social uh, animals, typically the data collection process looks like this. Ecologists going out in the field, observing um, you know, getting environmental data, observing animals. Um, this is uh, one of my former postdocs, David Papano, who this is studying gelada baboons. So this is not ice cream, spelled differently, but they're herbivorous, completely herbivorous. They're not baboons either. They're completely herbivorous primates in Ethiopia. And you typically um, can have two options for observing animal behavior, uh, social behavior. You can either focus on a particular individual and note all their interactions where you can uh, do scans uh, for a fixed period of time where I try to note all the interactions that are happening in a group and even with three individuals as shown here observing the entire the group you cannot observe the entire group if you look up on the left there there's clearly you know baboons that are out of sight for all the observers so there's a lot that's being missed in these kinds of modalities so how can we uh, get data in other ways. What other data can might we be able to use? Well, one source of data that is, you know, the most abundant, readily available source of information today about pretty much anything, are images. So either coming from camera uh, camera traps or uh, shown here, and this is from a course in field computational ecology where we bring computer scientists and ecologists into the field, and they work on um, uh, interdisciplinary problems, this is graduate students, or, uh, you know, tourists or field scientists observing, um, observing and taking pictures. The problem then is what do we do with these images? Um, what we really need to do is extract information about each individual. Well, that was the inspiration behind the Wild Book project. You know, this ability of 
take images from any source, whether it's scientists, field assistants, camera traps, or drones, or tourists posting on social media, their images on social media, and taking all these millions of images and finding all the pictures that contain animals. So can you, I don't know if you can see all the, find all the zebras here. Um, and if you can tell me right away how many, please do. And if you want to interrupt or ask a question, please do right away. Um, I am not monitoring the chat. It's hard while giving a talk, so please uh, let me know if there's a question. So yes, so how can we take these millions of images and then find, we, we've built a system that can find not only uh, which ones contain zebras, but also um, find all the images that contain animals, find where the animals are in those pictures, find a, put a bounding box around each one, including that baby elephant finding, hiding behind its mom, the calf, um, and identify not only species, but down to individual animal as in the Zippy the zebra and Joe the giraffe, you know, Terry the turtle and Willie the whale. And so there's a large amount of machine learning. Sorry, I realized that the sound is not coming from the right thing. So let me um, make sure that the sound comes through the computer. Uh, so, So, microphone, speaker, this should be, um, hey, let me do this then. Each image is processed through a series of convolutional neural networks and matching algorithms. The first network determines whether there are any animals of interest, in this case, zebras. The next set of networks localize each animal in its own subregion and classify the species. At this point, background segmentation is performed on the subregion to generate a rough mask of the zebra. Once this is done, key points are extracted from the zebra and feature descriptors are built. These descriptors serve as a sort of fingerprint that can be compared for similarity against previously identified individual animals in a large database. The scores from this comparison allow the system to decide which animals are the most likely matches. When the match has high enough confidence, it's accepted immediately. Matches that have lower confidence are shown to a human expert who then makes the final decision. And Yes, and so with the with the information, and we can do it for anything striped, spotted, wrinkled, notched, or you know, such as leopards or zebras, or even sharks. We or even using the shape of a whale's fluke for the dorsal fin of a dolphin. So then, with information on when and where the image was taken, we can really use images to track individuals, count them, or even in, even extract their social interactions. And their social network is shown here for Pinchy, the sperm whale, who is the most uh, cited animal in a wild book for whales and dolphins, fluke book. And she's been cited more than 600 times. So we really can track their social interactions. Um, recently, technology has also been used to uh, to infer networks or track animals, or track animals, we infer networks later uh, from as small as ants by putting QR codes. This is a project at Ecole Polytechnique Fédérale de Lausanne. Um, that, you know, that's a job for an undergraduate student, clearly. Or putting ultra, ultraviolet tattoos on frogs or, or you know, coloring ants uh, or, or tracking bees. So animals large and small, um, on large animals, we can also put GPS colors, not only images, uh, we, we can put GPS colors, or uh, in this case, zebras, that's with a solar panel, they're switching. And finally, uh, we've tracked baboons. So this is a collaboration with uh, Dr. Mac Crawford, who is now at Max Planck Institute and uh, University of Constance. And this is a day in a life of a baboon troop. So in 2012 and more recently in 2019, tra tracked the entire troop of baboons uh, for a month at resolution of one hertz. So that's once a second. So every second there is a GPS lock. So 
let's get our bearings around the social uh, social interactions of baboons. So this is a day, as I said, in the life of a troop of baboon. So the network here is inferred. So I encourage you to watch what's going on here. So they wake up on the over the river in the trees that they sleep there and start crossing the space to the other side to get to food, where the, to the part where they for, forage. So, so there's um, one animal that kind of, as you're watching, what the question I would ask you is, is it, what, do you think it's a male or a female? What that one that just joined the, the, the group going forward, right? So there's, there's this group that went off. Now notice, okay, so there is a, an animal that's joining that group. Male or female, adult or juvenile, dominant or subordinate. So, so coming back, something happens, and so the whole troop is now kind of one, one long network appears to be. So let's watch it again. We're not going to do a poll. But the, the event, so right now, about that, that one individual is about to join the front. Okay, so tell me a story, or tell yourself a story, what's going on, and I'll tell you what actually happened. Boom, something happens, and then, you know, the whole troop kind of becomes connected. So... Because we cannot do a poll here and raise hands and you have uh, and you guys yelling out uh, your guesses, I'll tell you what's going on there. And most of the time, it's not the story that people thought was going on. That individual is actually the alpha male who waits for the initial reasonably young scouts, male scouts, to go out. Okay, they're not attacked. There's no leopard in the air. Now it's safe for him to to go. And uh, the rest of the troop watching them, you know, starts going too. But what he does by coming back is not to tell them, okay, okay, come on, come on, come on. What he does by coming back is stands there in the middle of the troop and essentially tells them, reasserts his dominance and saying, I'm going to be the first one to get to food. What he does is standing there in the middle of the troop, it goes like this, Woo! and everybody kind of scatters. And so... Um, he has no interest in bringing the rest of the group with him, but by drawing a network, we're essentially deceiving our own intuition about what's, what may be going on. And that's an important point, that networks are models that may or may not really tell us about what's going on. So uh, we, the other thing that is missing here is these are just GPS colors, so we just know their location, right? So we don't really know the, the, the behavior. So to get to the behavior, we, we added to GPS colors, we added other sensors such as putting, uh, because a lot of the behavior, especially brown baboons, happens through, you know, using hands, using arms. Um, and so we added a bracelet with the accelerometer that allows us to get, you know, the positions of their hands. Uh, it's like a boon, uh, Fitbit, we call it Boonbit. Here's, here's uh, the Boonbit being tested on graduate students. You know, they're doing grooming. Uh, and if you notice, the uh, the rightmost graduate student is using, he's a lefty, using his left hand. Clearly, we didn't put the, the, the boon bit on the right hand, uh, on the correct hand. So again, there's possibility of missing data. Uh, we tested, finally tested that on, uh, you know, an animal that is easy to handle, most, you know, pretty domesticated, but in size and shape, pretty close to baboons meet um, our resident uh, testing sheep. So the question then is, okay, so we have data, right? We have data on locations. We also have data on proximity of direct proximity of baboons. We have data now also the voice recording of their vocalizations, their gestures uh, and behavior. The question, the first question is how good do we go from all of these we don't really have data on their behavior. We have or locations. We have a whole bunch of sensor data. How do we go from the sensor data to what biologists really care about? And that's this ethogram of their behavior. Uh, you know, that's a complicated. The ethogram is the, this uh, hierarchical tree of behavior classes, the types of behavior. So. 
really, you know, this is really complicated uh, set of behaviors that matter for social interactions. And so we've done a lot of work going from multivariate time series to actually inferring behavior. So we're now ready to go from, from data, whether it's images to and, and or sensors to uh, networks. So once we have data, there are many, many, many ways that we can define network. We can define the network of, you know, just proximity. Typically, biologists say that, you know, interactions happen when animals are close enough for long enough. So what's close, what's long, right? Is it within certain radius? Is two feet, three feet, five feet? Or is it the three nearest neighbors because they can't pay attention to, to more than three? Uh, does the line of sight matter? Is it what's long enough? Um, you know, five seconds or five minutes? Do vocalizations matter? Do we know where they're looking? And so on and so forth. So even with a simple definition, there are many, many ways um, to define networks. And then when we get into, oh, the networks of friendships, the networks of reciprocal grooming, or, you know, there, there are many options. And really, depending on definition, we're going to get very, very different networks. And the inference that we're going to get out of it is really, really drastically different. And there's a lot of danger. Uh, that comes with different definitions of networks. So biologists have written a lot about it. There's been um, a lot of work in human in inferring human networks and the, the, the banana skills, the skins that come with that as well. And so uh, with and, and going beyond social networks, uh, there's been a variety of ways of inferring networks from data. Um, and and most of them essentially. Uh, are pretty ad hoc. And a lot of the analysis assumes that, OK, we have a network. Now let's do something. But we don't have a network. What we have is data and a question on that data, right? So how do social animals make decisions? How does individual, uh, how is uh, a change in group behavior initiated by individual behavior? Who are the initiators of that change? Right? These are questions based on um, data that we have, maybe from sensors or from observations. You know, And uh, by staring a lot at that data and having a lot of background knowledge, there are some hypotheses that we may infer. This is the standard scientific process. And uh, you know, we may, through additional experiments, test, test these hypotheses. A network is just another model that allows us to go from data to hypotheses, hopefully testable hypotheses. And as such, uh, a network, like any other model, is only as good as the answers that it helps us provide for the questions we're asking on the data that we have. So. As any other model, we really should have a way of doing model selection, of testing the goodness of fit of that model, and have a choice between networks on the same data based on the question that we're trying to answer. And so we proposed a whole framework for task-focused network inference of going from data to question with a network as a model that allows us to an answer with a network as a model that allows us to do that. So given uh, given potential uh, abstract definitions of network of different networks on data, we select among these models based on the uh, the, the the performance of the of the network as a model for the question for the task. So I'll give you an example in the next in the next uh, couple of slides. So, actually, before we get there, so you know we can define a variety of networks as I showed you. You know, proximity network; it, those are parameterized networks about what's long, close enough and long enough. But we can also, you know, even when we talk about k nearest neighbors, we can define. K equals zero means everybody is a singleton. There are no connections, right? 
So that allows us to look at purely, you know, the autocorrelation, the attributes of individual node as a model for answering the question that we're asking. On the other hand, we can look at a network where everybody is connected. And then within the same framework, right, that's, that's really not a social network that tells us that what's going on there is collective behavior, meaning uh, this is the sort of a function on the entire population because everybody is connected. So this framework really is a nice sort of one unifying approach to asking everything, you know, to selecting among models that no network is really there. Is there really actually a network that's driving the phenomenon that we're observing? all the way to, to through the social networks, to structured heter heterogeneous social network to um, collective behavior where it's, where it's a function on the entire population, the entire group. And so one of the examples um, really asking how do individuals uh, position themselves within the group? Is it something about, uh, is it something about just who they are? such as their demographics, their juveniles, adults, females, males. So maybe all the juveniles are, you know, in the center of the group and the males are the front and the females in the back or the other way around. So this would mean it's not a network. It's not a network question. It's just about sort of who they are. Is it about their pref individual preferences, right? So it's not, it's not explained by demographic, but it's explained just by past history. So autocorrelation, right? Past history of their positions in the group. Is it about, or is it indeed about a network, right? They like to be with their friends. And so then the, the some number of their friends should predict their position within a group. And so this approach of looking at the entire network as a, uh, as, as, as an entire set of networks as, as potential models allowed us to, to start answering this question. So first of all, it's not, you know, it's not about who they are. It is really about the interactions. And we can take it further. We can ask if we want to predict the, not the position within group, but the actual position of where an individual, the coordinate of where an individual is going to be. Again, is it just, you know, everybody is just walking by themselves? and figuring out, you know, you can predict based on their past history of location, or is it about, you know, the, the environment of where they are, or is it really about the interactions? And by looking at these uh, candidate networks, we really can answer this question and select the best model. So this is in this case, we select the network that is most predictive, gives the, the most accurate prediction about the uh, position of each individual baboon and the um, and so we essentially take these trajectories and we look at potential candidate networks of all these individuals we infer and vary and evaluate various network models where neighbors predict an individual's future location and turns out that there is really not one, but two different networks. And that depends on the time scale at which you're trying to predict the location. Essentially, how far into the future are you interested in knowing the location of each individual? So if we're looking at short-term associations up to about 10 minutes into the future, then it really is the network of nearest neighbors that's most predictive. And if we're looking at long-term predictions, so about, you know, from about half an hour to, to two hours into the future, then it's the network of long-term affiliations. So to put it in human terms, if we're deciding where we're gonna meet for dinner, remember the times when we're deciding to where we're going to meet for dinner. So if we're deciding where we're going to meet for dinner, we're going to talk to our friends, you know, and, and figure out on location. But as we're going there, perhaps in a group of people we may not even know, 
then the local decision to go around this bush on the left or on the right is really about, you know, we're going to go with wherever our immediate neighbors are going, so with the majority of our immediate neighbors. So, so not only that, but the interesting part, it's not just any number of neighbors. Turns out that the most, in the troop of 28 baboons, the most predictive network was the network of four to six nearest neighbors. So four to six nearest neighbors are most predict, the network of four to six nearest neighbors is most predictive of uh, the 10 minute into the future. And the network of four to six long-term affiliates is most predictive of about up to about two hours into the future. So, so, um, and then, you know, if you, as you start adding neighbors, the, the, the accuracy of prediction de de degrades. So this is, uh, you know, and this is important and, uh, and poses a hypothesis of why is it four to six, right? Is it about, you know, uh, what they essentially can keep in mind, what, who they're paying attention to, um, or uh, is it the in terms of is it about visibility? So that's kind of the next biological step. But it proposed a hypothesis of what's going on there that can be actually tested. So the next question uh, that we're, we're we're asking the biologists were asking, and this is. Again, this is collaboration with a large group. So that includes um, Meg Crawford, Ian Cousin, um, Damien Ferrin, and uh, uh, Ariana uh, sandberg peshkin So if we're uh, in this sort of process of the group moving together or the group sitting first at the beginning of the day, you know, hanging out on the trees, and then starting to move or deciding to go to the left or to the right you know how does this process of decision making of the change of state that results in the uh, of the change of state of the entire group how does that happen who initiates it and what is the process of the group transitioning from one state from one type of behavior from one direction to another so Biologists uh, using other using other data and uh, other sort of approaches. Uh, the 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 observation the, the the hypothesis was that it is shared decision making that drives collective behavior and uh, collective movement specifically in wild baboons. Fantastic. So let's look at how we might answer this question is in computational network analysis. So we proposed a uh, leadership inference framework. This was done by um, Chai, China Rong Amor Bacharvei, one of my former PhD students, you know, in collaboration with the entire group. So if we start with these multidimensional time series of coordinates or um, accelerometer data or other type of information, let's say trajectories, so coordinates, we come to a state where the entire group has coalesced. Let's say they were sitting and then they uh, started moving. They were stationary and then they started moving. So if you know, we look at the trajectories of the individuals, the coordinated state when the entire troop is doing the same thing means the trajectories should be reasonably similar. And we can imagine the process. And so we're looking here, you know, they were milling around and now, you know, some individuals started walking and then the rest are joining. And so we look at this trace of trajectories. When the entire troop is moving, their trajectories essentially have the same shape or more or less the same with possible delay, right? So the initial group started and then the rest followed. And so we're looking at this network of following and that's the most salient network in fact here. That's the one that's most predictive of the troop, of the group behavior. So 
the the we infer this network of who follows whom by looking at the similarity of the time series with a delay, right? And so that when when the whole troop right has already coalesced into coordinated behavior, then the decision at this point has already been made, right? So if we're interested in how that decision to change the direction or to start moving or to move, you know, has happened, we really need to look at the pre-coordination period, right? And so how do we identify computationally from data this pre-coordination period? And how do we then from then figure out who is the individual who initiated or a set of individuals? So looking at this, sorry, looking at this pre-coordination period and the network of following, if uh, when there's when when the group is uh, let's say sitting around, then then essentially nobody's following anybody, right? The group is uncoordinated. By the time the group is coordinated, everybody is following everybody, so that every, all the trajectories should, should look the same. And this transition from not few, if any, fo individuals following somebody to everybody following everybody, right, means that the network of following goes from very, very sparse, very few edges, um, to essentially a complete network. So if we just look at the density of this network, we can really identify this process of transitioning from uncoordinated state of the group to the coordinated one. And so that is what what we're looking at. So this is uh, an example where we look at this process of starting the movement in the morning of this troop. And you can look, so this is the, the, the panel, this, the, the three networks um, are before they start moving, the middle one, during this process of kind of some have already started, others not quite. And then the last one is when the whole troop is moving along. If you look at the density, this is exactly what we're seeing. We're seeing uh, the following network density goes from near zero to nearly one. And so the next question is, how do we actually find the individuals who initiated this transition? And so this, this goes back to very, very, very old concept from 1930s. Uh, individuals who, who are leaders in a transition are those who are followed by many, who are followed by many, who are followed by many. And this is exactly, precisely the definition of page rank. And this is also the reason why this definition was used as page rank by Google um, page ranking algorithm. So this is, uh, if and if we look at the, the, the page rank, of the individual who initiates the transition. It's not necessarily the one who is up front leading the whole troop as you know the troop already moving all co in coordinated way. And this is uh, why it's so important also to look at this period of transition and initiation. Given, we can not only identify the individual who initiates this transition and initiates the decision-making process essentially of the troop, of the group, we can look at different models of uh, how this group transition to, to different uh, uh, group state may happen. We can look at, uh, we can ask, is it a random? So every, every individual just, you know, randomly, randomly follows some other individuals. Uh, is it the, the sort of dictatorship model where everybody follows Everybody follows uh, just one individual, this one alpha male, and that's it. Or is it hierarchical that I follow, you know, I follow uh, my boss who follows their boss, and she's following, uh, uh, and she's the one who's leading the troop? Or is it the one where it's uh, sort of uh, various forms of uh, majority? So let's say linear threshold, right, where every individual follows the majority of their neighbors. And so we can look at, we can generate essentially um, 
uh, simulated forms of transition and train a classifier to identify which model is the uh, most likely to fit the data that we observe. And, uh, and then uh, ask the classifier once it's trained, okay, so now we have one data point, that troop of baboons. Where do they fit in these different uh, models? Turns out they fit very nicely within this uh, uh, linear threshold. So they really are following the majority of their neighbors in the process of uh, movement initiation. Fantastic. So this is uh, really, you know, whew, our computational approach agreed with biologists. Uh, and, uh, you know, at least we, <laughs> yeah, uh, this is a sanity check, but it also allows us now to make all other inference, right? Uh, and, and really start asking questions. So are there different initiators for different types of behavior in different contexts? Um, does the process of initiation of behavior change with different species, you know, and so on and so forth. So, uh, and this is exactly what we're doing now. Sorry, other characteristic, different characteristics of, of, of uh, leaders, which we've also looked at, you know, are they the ones who change, for example, in the movement context, are they the ones who change the direction, change the, uh, you know, change the uh, velocity, acceleration. So, so do they have particular demographic? So all of these questions are now answerable. So hopefully I've shown you very briefly, just a taste, an example of how computational approaches can really help answer questions in this case about why do animals, including humans, do what they do? How do they make social decisions? And how we can use computational approaches to answer questions about that help us understand our own sort of behavior, sociality, and decision-making process. To quote Poincaré, in the scientific process, you know, uh, the scientist has at his, if the scientist had at his disposal the infinity of time, all he would have to look is look at everything. But since it is impossible to look at everything, and more importantly, it's impossible to look carefully at everything, and it is better not to look at all that to look carelessly, the first choice that any scientist then faces is what to look at, right? What should we really choose as our starting observation? And to me, what computational approaches really bring into this scientific process is the ability to look at more things more carefully. So we bring more data. We, you know, these computational approaches for network inference, when you have a lot of data, it is now possible to sort through possible definitions, through possible parameterizations, and really ask, what is the right network model and extract patterns and structure that hopefully provide uh, insight in the, and answer questions that we couldn't answer before and even ask questions that we couldn't answer before. So this looking at more things more carefully and finding really new uh, questions and answers. And I would like to thank my own network this is woefully incomplete and constantly growing of collaborations and uh, various uh, organizations that support our research thank you thanks uh, <clears throat> tanya for a very interesting presentation um we're going to let the uh, members of the audience uh ask questions and I think maybe we could try to do this in two parts. Uh, first, um, with regard to the work that you described, there's a lot of interesting issues about data collection and data management uh, with regard to the baboons that you studied. 
and then maybe we could turn to uh, extrapolation to humans sure. in a certain way. So um, we can use the Q and A in the chat function uh, to pose questions to uh, to Tanya. I can start by asking you a question. Sure, of course. Um, so when you, uh, I'm interested in the data collection and data management process mm -hmm. because you have um, uh, multiple ways of observing. You have the baboon fits and you have collars and you have the visual uh, elements of the data collection. Um, how many different types of data did you collect and what were the issues in putting the pieces together? It's an excellent question. And uh, so for baboons, I mean, data management, we often, it's, you know, often the non-sexy part of the research process, but it's, it's the making, you know, making a break, it, make it or break it part of the, of the data-driven research process, right? And it's 80% of time that, that we spend in it. And then often, we don't put enough thought a priori of how we're going to to manage and store it and then make it accessible searchable archivable and so years of data collection quite often become inaccessible later so the for baboons um, we we only recently started adding visual and uh, so so all of it is really about so right now there is a color that is uh, that has GPS, voice, uh, magnetometer, so we know the orientation, um, the proximity sensor, so direct Bluetooth to, you know, so you don't have to go through um, a GPS uh, and accelerometer, uh, so we know the position of the whole baboon, and then there is uh, some of them, we're still testing, this, some of them have these Fitbits, boon bits, as well as, um, uh, we're now, so biologists now are experimenting for their sleeping side because uh, really accelerometers are not great for the z-axis to figure out where they position on the tree or when they sleep on the cliffs using thermal cameras. And then there's, in addition, there's a whole bunch of experiments that are going on um, that have coded, RFID coded uh, feeding boxes that only certain baboons have access to so it depends on who your friends are so to really test this uh, point about uh, is it your friends or is it about who you are so there's tons of data just for that right so really um, that particular all of that data are stored at Max Planck and they have data commons so this is uh, metadata rich um, uh, data, these are multivariate time series, and they are uh, aligned, and they, you're still in the process uh, of making sure that everything is aligned, cleaned up, and uh, searchable. So, and um, for more generally, for uh, the, <laughs> for image data, so Wildbook, and I'll show you just a little bit. So Wildbook, when we started, you know, we created this system. Um, it started out with a publication in um, an obscure computer vision journal. It turned out that it's incredibly useful for, um, for biologists to be able to identify individual animals from photographs. And so uh, people started asking us, and within two months we had requests for uh, for more than 70, 70 species, and so we decided to start a nonprofit. So we started this nonprofit, Wild Me, um, and it's in more general AI, artificial intelligence uh, for conservation solutions. Uh, one of the big projects is this: uh, the platforms Wild Books that can go from image to individual identification. So right now we have platforms for more than uh, 60, I think the latest count, 63 species, ranging from whales and sharks to 
lynx and zebras and turtles and skunks and even um, uh, weedy and leafy sea dragons. And so to, to show you an example, um, so, so for whale sharks, actually, I'm going to show an example of, I just realized whale sharks are not social particularly. Uh, and by the way, we can even take sort of YouTube videos and find, but um, so going back to Pinchy and the very social sperm whale. So hopefully it's going to ask me to log in. All right. So yes. Um, so this whole system comes with an incredibly rich, and that was the challenge, and that's the reason, you know, it's not enough to have a computer vision algorithm that can take a picture and identify individual. How do you manage these images? How do you bring all the metadata? How do you know that this is, how do you kind of bring together all the images of the same individual, right? So this is all the pictures, oops, um, of, uh, of Pinchy. So, you know, if we were going to uh, look at all of the, how do we know that these are all the images of um, of the same individual? Uh, and, uh, okay. And if we want to look at all the sightings, in this case, going to long before Wild Book it was even a thought, how do we <coughs> find the sightings? How do we find data associated with these sightings? And people uploaded them, a scientist in this case uploaded them. So how do we find these uh, the, the the information about each sighting, who uploaded it, where was it, and so on and so forth. So that data management was the main reason we actually uh, created Wildbook. It's a primarily a data management system with a, a big machine learning computer vision component to it. Uh, you can query it. It's it's uh, directly connected to R with. Uh, all the social network and, uh, and many other so uh, social network analysis tools in this case um, and many many other ones so geospatial as well so and more broadly the translational data analytics institute tdi uh, one of the things that we sort of thought a lot about as uh, for to, to to support and enable data-driven research is we created uh, data commons in, and in collaborations with libraries, made sure that uh, not only that the data has a place to store, in this case, Ohio Supercomputing Center, but also it's archivable, retrievable, searchable. And um, most universities today have some form of service like this, but it's still a an incredibly labor-intensive process. And I think I've answered way more than you asked. <laughs> probably. But we do make all the data available. So the baboon data also is available through Dryad. Um, it's analyzable and we also uh, publish our uh, wild book data as well. Well, let me just let me just follow up by saying in, in the example that you gave of the movement of the troop of baboons, yep. did that data come by satellite? By, no, uh, GPS collars. Those are GPS collars. You have to take the collar off in order to get so, the. Yeah, with baboons, that's that's an incredibly, you know, <laughs> it's a process, and there's a whole movie about it uh, that that uh, uh, I believe National Ge no Smithsonian Institute made uh, about the process of how do you put collars on baboons. Um, so you need to trap them, you need to tranquilize them, you need to have a vet present, make sure that, you know, everything is okay with the animal. Um, they take, luckily these are not endangered, so uh, when the animal is endangered, like gravy zebras, it's probably not even feasible, but, you know, to do it, but still for, you know, people put collars on uh, endangered species. So uh, they take all the vitals, they monitor the vitals, and then uh, you release the animal, have to wait until they completely recovered. And then, yeah, so make sure that the color doesn't catch on, the, on a tree or on a branch or, you know, um, the battery doesn't explode, that happened, um, or not, not with our baboons, or the, uh, 
uh, and then that it when the when it automatic that you can download the data which is a whole other process and then it automatically falls off so they have this little um, electric charge essentially which opens up the the, the collar at the at the end of the month and the, w w in the movie it's hilarious when you watch them kind of like it's it's super super mild but they still it startles them so they kind of like oh you know like jump jump up a little bit um so and and that was one of the motivation not only it's expen it, it's you know it's dangerous for the for the animal uh it's quite often dangerous for the humans when we talk about elephants for example uh, there's also not enough. You can't put a collar on every animal. We've, you know, this is a whole troop, and it's incredible. It's it's really unique data set uh, because the whole troop is tracked, and it's tracked at you know every second there is a location for every baboon, and that's and for a month. So even humans are not tracked that way, <laughs> for the most part. Um, but the the it's it. it it's also that they're expensive. Each color, which in, the color plus the cost of, uh, you know, making sure that it's nice leather collar itself and all the technology and the the, the, the time of the vet and everybody else present, is it about um, is a couple of thousand dollars per color. So that was one of the motivation of using images also as the source of information and and really. Uh, because that is non-invasive, we have tons of them, and we can even use people to kind of, in these massive efforts, to get the network on a more regular and higher resolution level. So, so with zebras, in fact, we have an event, uh, Great Graves Rally, where hundreds of people drive around Kenya for two days in January. Um, started in 2016, did it also 2018, 2020, and about to, in starting to plan for 2022 taking picture of every gravy zebra that they see. That is, not only it produces the most accurate census of the population, and Kenya Wildlife Service now uses this process to, to, to adjust its uh, endangered species management process. And the UCN Red List uses that, the numbers that come as the official numbers for the species. But it also allows these kinds of, you know, less intense versions of this process that are done by um, conservation organizations and uh, scientists, uh, science projects allow to really monitor the social networks of the species. So we have a question, uh, Tanya, from a member of the audience, Ernie King. The common folklore is that Google internet companies and phone companies collect a lot of location data about their users. Do you think that they do similar analyses as what you described and what kind of results have they published? Right. So um, we don't really know what I'm, I'm absolutely sure that they do versions of. So not exactly what we've shown, because that's not the questions they're asking. Uh, but in terms of uh, networks that are predictive of individuals location, for example, you know, that's been known for quite a while that, you know, where you're going to be, your friend's gonna tell Google where you're going to be. And so one of the extensions of the work that we've been doing to flip this question of, you know, what is the network that's, uh, this, this question of what is the network that's most predictive of, you know, your location or your music preference or your uh, beer rating I'm not taking this example as completely out of the air. We really, when you know, we developed the framework, we tested it not on baboons. <laughs> I mean, baboons and humans. So we really looked at a variety of social networks and asking, okay, if you want to predict labels for a node, how do we infer the, the network that's most predictive of the label, as I said, such as music, the next album you're going to, the next music genre you're going to play in a music social network or the, um, the, the, your movie or beer rating of for the next movie or the or your location it is really you can infer networks and then that begs the question of privacy and so what we started looking at is this notion of privacy shadow let's say you decide to not disclose your location not to share your location with google uh, does it really mean that they don't know where you are other than using, even if they're really 
you know, good and do not use the Wi-Fi or all the other uh, proximity, uh, proxies for, for your location. Can they, can they infer your location from other data? And the answer is absolutely. They can infer your location from the locations of your friends. And what we're showing is that there is essentially a shadow, right? That, that the temporary shadow, what, what they should be saying is, it's not that the moment you turn off your location sharing, you're not sharing your location. What should be saying, they should be telling you is, it will take three hours, seven days, you know, whatever it is, until we, you know, the accuracy of your location sharing will degrade. And we show that um, that uh, the there essentially kind of a range that for people whose past history, so where the network is, where the, the, there's kind of two extremes, where the most predictive network is no network at all. So for individuals whose past where other correlation is so strong, where your past history of location is highly predictive of where you're going to be. There is essentially no degre uh, no degrading of of your location prediction. Google can use your the model of where you've been and pretty well figure out where you're going to be. Um, for uh, for the the, uh, the the case where your location wasn't predictable very well from any network, so there is really no good network. You know, fantastic. So the moment you turn it off, right, it's off. But there is a large number of individuals. In fact, majority of individuals is uh, they are predictable, but from the their location is predictable from the location of their uh, associates, right? From uh, frequent uh, co-locators, and just like you know baboons, it's for the frequent associations, long-term associations that are most predictive, and the uh, it's 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 great in some ways because <laughs> that the accuracy of, pre of the location prediction of that network typically degrades pretty quickly. So, so if you turn off your location, but not quickly enough, so if you turn your location off, within about 12 hours, so about a day, the accuracy of those models, networked models, really degrades to the point where your location is not predictable. But it is a day right so so don't expect your location not being accessible to google the moment you turn it off uh, so uh ernie king would like to follow up if i wanted to do things that made this data less useful and more confusing what should i do make make new friends and do unpredictable things <laughs> it's as simple as that yeah, be social in in uh, unpredictable ways. <laughs> so yeah, uh, I mean, it's it's really you know it, it is encouraging to continue to explore, to continue to do new things, try new things with new people, make friends. So the 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 presentation raised for me uh, a, a question on the following order. When you study the baboons, you and your colleagues study the baboons, you're focused primarily on one troop and keeping track of them as they move along. In terms of human behavior, mm -hmm. is there such a thing as a kind of uh, multi-level model of networks yeah. so that if we if we thought about something like black lives matter uh organizing to have local uh gatherings and demonstrations so there's an issue of a particular group of individuals in a particular place but then the uh, movement could build geographically, even you know, regionally or nationally. And then if there is enough activity across these groups, you could think about 
a national organization trying to coordinate and or is that too far fetched? No, that, that is, is not. And in fact, so, you know, well, the colleagues, the inspiration comes from questions about baboons or zebras, the, the methodology that we create, right, the methods we create, they're, they're at the level of abstraction, it really doesn't matter whether it's zebras, baboons, humans, or, uh, or, or brain cells, for that matter. I mean, these are uh, methods for, um, we go from time series to network inference, you know, task-focused network inference to network analysis. And so the, um, the, 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 the question you're asking is about community inference. And uh, even in, you know, if we don't consider time aspect of it, you know, in a static network, a community is a cluster. And just like any other cluster, it, it really depends on the scale, both in, in this case, the number of individuals, right, that, that, that you're looking at at the cluster, as you just pointed out, uh, if we were right now in a physical classroom, in a physical sort of auditorium together, uh, are we a cluster? You know, uh, it, well, are we, if we're, you know, all in the same location within the university, are we then a cluster, the same city, are we then a cluster? And so it really depends on the scale because cluster mathematically uh, is defined as a collection of points, right, that are closer to each other than they are to points in other clusters. So, uh, you know, the right there in that definition there is an it's embedded this relative aspect so if we're looking at points that are closer to each other than they are to points in other clusters whatever the embedded space whether it's physical actual distance or you know the frequency of social interactions it has to be relative to what right so so if we look at individuals in the classroom Compared to uh, compared to everybody else at the university, yeah, sure. Right now they're a cluster because they're closer to each other than they are to others. Um, but if we look at uh, with it, you know, if our entire world is just the individuals in this classroom, then we might find subclusters there, right? So clusters of relatively closer groups of people than who are closer to each other than they are to people in other clusters within this classroom. And so, in fact, community to really is defined the, the, the actual, the straight up definition of um, communities is cohesive subgroups, and this is from the, the, the um, textbook, uh, the cohesive subgroups uh, of subset of subsets of actors among whom there are relatively strong, direct, intense, frequent, or positive ties. This is from Wasserman and Faust. Um, and so this relatively aspect is exactly the same, relative to what? So it really depends of what's your entire, you know, the, 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 the entire population that you're considering with, and the communities are inferred relatively to, relatively to the entire population. And so, um, so when now when you add the dynamic aspect to it, when groups can actually change and merge and uh, reassemble, that what started me dynamic community inferences was started me on this whole path of network analysis in the first place, um, and and it was a question that was asked uh, by Dan Rubinstein from Princeton, who is an ecologist uh, interested in social behavior, in particular of zebras. So there's a whole. Uh, you know, direction there. It was a question asked by him and his uh, graduate students over a casual coffee of how do you, you know, social, zebras and many other social animals have this fission fusion structure of interactions where the groups within the, the population, within the, the troop, uh, within the uh, group, the, the, the smaller groups can fist and fuse, right? They, they, they come together and they split and they come together and they split. And the question is, do they split and reassemble randomly or is there some cohesive aspect to it? Is there some 
uh, persistence of the groupings. And that essentially is the, the dynamic communities. That's where what led to the entire framework of dynamic communities, uh, because turns out nobody has done it at the time, looked at this. Uh, it's essentially the question that you're asking. And, and then how do you infer those and, and how do you you know, how do you even define those and for those? And then it took us about 10 years and that allowed us to really answer the question for zebras 10 years later. And the question is, yes, there are persistent <laughs> groupings and they're really, uh, really governed, kind of driven uh, by, the, they're, they're driven by, uh, you know, they're different in different species and they're driven very much by the sex in this case of the animal. So males and females uh, uh, assemble and reassemble differently. They have very different kind of notions of community and persistence. But uh, it also led us to wonderful explorations in life of baboons and humans and even brain cells, as I mentioned. Other questions from uh, the audience? You guys have been super patient with all the technical, uh, with all the technical difficulties we had. And, <laughs> and, you know, I realized early as this, you know, without any technology or means of communication, just how much we're relying on this, that uh, in this day and age, especially. So uh, I very much appreciate everybody staying up late. Well, especially uh, <clears throat> under conditions of COVID, so. Right, because if I, if I was there, right, uh, I'm just three hours away. <laughs> <But> <laughs> You know, if this was continuing for a little longer, would be, would have been easier to drive. Right. Yeah. Well, uh, I want to thank you uh, very much for this uh, uh, very interesting presentation. It'll give our uh, participants some things to think about in terms of the conceptual nature of the work that you do, uh, mostly in the wild, but thinking about how it applies to uh, political action committees and uh, members of parliaments uh, and also to social organizations and, and uh, social movements. Thanks very much for, for being with us this evening. Um, I want to uh, remind the participants and those who watch the video that we have uh, a um, what's a, a lecture described as uh, next Tuesday but actually it's been pre-recorded because the person uh, who's giving the lecture, um, uh, Quinn and Gwen from Maryland, um, can't, be can't be with us next Tuesday evening, but she will be here at lunchtime on Tuesday for the Q&A and that you will have uh, a week starting a couple of days ago to view her presentation on uh, YouTube, the ICPSR summer program YouTube channel. But uh, thank you, thank you again uh, for a very interesting presentation. And I hope that things settle in Columbus with <laughs> the the weather. Thanks again, Tanya. Thank you. Bye bye. Good night, bye -bye. everyone.